media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Work Society. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thank you, Jim. Stuart, was there anything in the federal budget that caught your eye? Well, I think the decision by Ottawa to put $100 million into the Clean Resource Innovation Network that invests in improvements in the oil and gas sector was a really timely and good signal, a signal that the sector can find ways to improve its ability to deliver the, the clean resources that everybody really wants these days. And, you know, this is a, an effort uh, based in Alberta, consortium of co- companies, not-for-profits, academic institutions. They're working to lower the environmental impacts of oil and gas sector because that's such an important part of the economy. You know, I was looking at our uh, trade surplus just for crude oil and bitumen exports for the fourth quarter of 2018 just came out. The the surplus alone is about $80 billion, a $80 billion from one quarter. And you don't get that from anything else in the economy. You can say that there's negatives with oil and gas. Most definitely there are. But there's also the fact that we are reliant on it globally in Canada, in BC, and we need to invest in getting better about it. So, I mean, that's definitely one thing. I applaud the federal government for this investment because it's going to reduce water and land use, lower greenhouse gas emissions, help to remediate well site and, and gas, oil wells, all that kind of thing that's so important. And the work is now being funded and done. So good news from that for sure. Well, it's nice to know Canadians are concerned about climate change but our ability to actually impact it, we're what, 1% of world greenhouse gases or something? Until well, those numbers the big for country- what Canada contributes. Yeah. Uh, when you especially consider that it is an energy exporter. You know, there's, there's countries in the world that uh, are importers and there are exporters. Some are kind of even, but uh, we are definitely an energy exporter. It's not only a big part of our economy, it's how we help other countries to have the fuels in their lives that they need to have. And, you know, we're not a Singapore or a Liechtenstein that doesn't produce any local energy significantly. Um, those countries have big economies and they rely on, on imports. And if they didn't have those imports, they couldn't have those strong economies. So, you know, everyone's got their role to play in this and you need to find a course that's most suited to who you are. So, so when I hear people just simply calling out Canada or other countries that export energy, uh, uh, aha, you've got a big uh, carbon footprint. Well, well, of course you do because you're an exporter and you're part of a global system. So, you know, I think it's easy to fall into these very simplistic characterizations of how things are without recognizing the role of innovation and international collaboration in in having improvement of our energy systems. Well, as you pointed out, because we uh, use a lot of energy that gives us our standard of living and without it, you pretty well are living in a cave off dead rats. That's right. And, you know, I think there's a tendency right now, you know, last week we had uh, children take to the streets with placards on, on climate change, making the voices heard. And, you know, I think everyone appreciates that young people have a point of view. I, I remember as a as a kid having a point of view. I remember writing a letter to the premier. I think it was... Uh, uh, Dave Barrett, who's a premier, I forget what I was writing to him about, but he, he sent me a very nice letter back. I was 10 years old, and I appreciated that. I kept that letter for many years. Maybe it's still around somewhere. It's great as a child to be engaged in political processes. And uh, at the same time, you also have to recognize that uh, with adulthood comes other responsibilities. You know, I, I was noticing recently in Victoria, the city of Victoria, they have a climate leadership plan. They're doing all sorts of good things from bike lanes to ensuring that their fleets of motorized vehicles are as efficient as they can be. But lately they've been sort of pulled and pushed into this climate litigation thing where the idea is taken from a leaf from the book of, you know, the big tobacco wars. Remember, remember back when big tobacco was being sued for 
gazillions of dollars because tobacco causes cancer, smoking causes cancer. And that resulted in an outcome where those tobacco companies had to admit that, yes, smoking causes cancer. And what I see right now is a climate litigation plan. It's recently migrated from the U.S., where it's been going on for years, to Western Canada. It's not anywhere else in Canada. It's in B.C. because we seem to have a special gene for for being open to these propositions. But anyways, they want to treat uh, the fuels in our lives, lives as if they're tobacco. They want to have cities pursue lawsuits to to ask fuel companies for damages for climate change. And I think a lot of people that get stuck in their craw, this idea that something which is not tobacco, it's uh, endlessly useful and needed in our lives. Certainly in modern society, it's it's synonymous with the hydrocarbon civilization. It's what we are. And that has negatives. Now, the problem with, I think, this litigation is it really polarizes people. It sets people at odds. The the local Chamber of Commerce, the Hotel Association, have recently started to speak out and say, now, wait a minute. You know, the Victoria um, CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce, just to quote uh, Catherine Holt and her chair, Dan Dagg, they wrote a letter to the mayor of Victoria complaining about this climate litigation plan, and they're saying climate change is not about us versus them. And that's so important when you consider that, you know, a city like Victoria, yeah, it aspires to be this kind of green leader, and that's great. But at the same time, I just noticed, I live in Victoria, Jim. I just was going down Douglas Street. You know what? There's a brand new car dealership. Maserati has just put out a shingle in Victoria, and they're selling high-powered motor cars that uh, are definitely reliant on hydrocarbons. That permit to build that building, I looked it up. I was pretty sure this would be the case, but sure enough, a couple of years ago, under the current mayor, the one who's pressing for climate litigation, signed off on a development permit for that building to be built. You know, at the same time, you go up to the airport, if you've been through the Victoria Airport, they're expanding. It looks like they're doubling the size of their departure lounge, and that probably means they're going to double the number of people who can go through it which means doubling the number of flights, and that means doubling the number of of liters of of fuel that need to be consumed to fly people around. And that's probably because in part of the cruise ship industry, these cruise ships are wonderful, painted white, they look so so angelic, but they actually belch out a lot of of, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and that's just part of this balance. So so I think when you see a city like Victoria, um, you know, pursuing this litigation, you do have to take it with a big grain of salt. I think the Chamber of Commerce is on a better track. They're saying, let's not polarize, let's work together on this. What the federal government is doing with the the uh, new budgetary measure for the Clean Resource Innovation Network, that's on the right track. Climate litigation, wrong track. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Albemarle's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, when it comes to natural resources, no province relies on them more than Alberta. Uh, they have an election coming up. What issues do you see there? And does Rachel Notley, you think, has a chance of survival with the province in recession right now? Yeah, it's uh, certainly interesting times. The number of job losses is one that uh, Jason Kenney, the opposition leader, leader of the United Conservative Party, former federal cabinet minister, is uh is talking about a lot because there's i can i can attest having uh, been in alberta in recent times lots of people are talking about that you go around downtown calgary in particular and it is a ghost town compared to how it was uh, just a few years ago uh, part of that is because of global conditions that are beyond our control 
the the uh, uh, management, however, of the Alberta energy sector generally is one thing that is always going to land on the lap of the current government, and the current government is being asked to answer for, you know, a number of its policies, some of the more, I, I think, colorful things that it's been criticized for when they when they appointed uh, one of the, I guess you would say, the anti-everything campaigners from British Columbia, Zipporah Berman, to one of the most important oil sands advisory panels to give them advice. Now, I mean, this is someone, I'm, I'm talking about a person who, uh, based on past practice, would never, ever be in any way supportive of the Alberta economy, um, but always look for a way to thwart it. So the idea that the the fox was put in the the hen house, as it were, is is one that I think uh, Jason Kenney will be talking about. On the other hand, uh, Rachel Notley, who I think is a person, has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, popular and genuine and seen as someone who's got uh, got a good positive vision. Her father was a legendary Alberta provincial leader who lost his life in a in a in an airplane accident uh, many years ago. She's someone who has got a rural background, real dirt under their fingernails. And so I think uh, definitely some credibility. On the other hand, her party is not one that has had a long history of uh, of, of uh, electoral success in Alberta. It, and you hear the phrase "one and done" is the NDP one and done. Um, at the same time, you know any party in government is able to uh, fight really hard and hold on to some of the levers of power that let it keep its power, and can always be expected to do. Everything it can, and you know, I've met many of the ministers in the Alberta NDP government. I think there's some some good folks there. I also have met many many of the the uh, Jason Kenney team, and and I also see sincere people who want to build Alberta there. So um, it's going to be a, the choice of the Alberta people, and and uh, hopefully it's one that allows ultimately Canada to to have success from the energy sector because right now we're not getting fair market value for or natural gas, or or crude oil and bitumen, it is being most of it given away to the Americans to consume rather profitably uh, at our expense, and that's because we don't have access to foreign markets. And access to foreign markets comes from things like LNG, which will let us get full market value for natural gas and having a pipeline to any coast, in particular, of course, right now the West Coast with the Trans Mountain pipeline, critically important for all Canadians. Anyone who you hear dismissing that as, oh, it's about Albertans, it's not about Albertans. It's about every single Canadian because, as I said before, with those export stats, it's what pays the rent for Canada. If we don't have that, what people are proposing who want to stop us getting fair value is maybe ramping down our economy and our expectations. Maybe we should go down to a sort of Lithuanian style or Argentina. Like We, we need to radically reset where we stand in the world and what choices we have if we choose to get out of having a prosperous oil and gas sector we'll and have resources more. generally. Right. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after the break. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. Work programs are underway in Finland and Canada. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol ADD, on Frankfurt symbol 82A1, and the OTCQB symbol ASDZF. Please visit our website arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, what's the political uh, scheme in Washington State where, on one hand, they welcome uh, tankers full of Alaskan oil down to their refineries, but they don't want uh, tankers carrying BC or Alberta oil out to the world. Yeah, I think you know, just as parts of BC can be kind of in a bubble on things, you know, people talk about Lotus Land and Vancouver. Well, Washington State is kind of a Lotus Land of of the USA, and there's people there like their governor Jay Inslee who are in this kind of myopic green bubble where they. Yeah, of course, their heart's in the right place and they want to do good things. But I think when 
on Sunday, and if you look at my my Twitter account, Jim, my my Twitter handle is S J Muir M U I R. And on Sunday morning, I was I was just looking as I do from time to time at an app called Marine Traffic, and it lets you see where all the ships of the world are, and you can you can select them by the type of ship, and you can look at just the oil tankers or just the tankers. And I, I noticed that, you know, we hear about, uh, you know, Canada shouldn't be allowed to export oil through the Strait of Juan de Fuca because it's too dangerous to ship oil through there. Well, well, guess what? There were three tankers bringing crude oil to Washington State's oil refineries at the same time, passing passing Victoria. You know, you if you had a really strong set of... Uh, of, of spyglass, a, a really good spy, spyglass, you'd be able to see those ships from maybe a high hill in Victoria because they're on the far side of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And there they were, three of them. Now, that's in one day, in one morning. And we have the governor of Washington who is complaining that Canada wants to send one ship a day, just one ship a day, out through that same waterway to get our crude oil to market so it fetches its fair market value. And he's actually... Going further than that, he's he's working with the BC government to try to use every tool in his toolbox to interfere in in Canadian politics and law and legislation to stop Canada from doing that. I mean, the hypocrisy is truly monumental. Well, I would uh, imagine the Americans would be pretty upset if we did the same thing to them. Oh, you know, didn't we? I think just a few days ago there was that new destroyer in the U.S. Navy. It's one of those sleek things. It's designed so the radar, you know, doesn't doesn't Stealth, see it. Yeah, but yeah, that was here. I mean, that's a what multi-billion-dollar ship. Do you think in about five seconds that thing wouldn't be in our harbor if we, you know, try to stop their tankers like they're trying to stop ours? Of course it would. You know, when uh, a government of B.C. years back got the fishermen and Prince Rupert to blockade the Alaska ferry. That darn near sparked an international incident. It came so close. I was quite uh, quite well aware at that time of what was going on between the various governments. And uh, let me tell you, if it had persisted, we would have seen uh, extreme measures eventually kick into place. They were they were not happy in Washington D.C. about about the idea that a sovereign ship of of the USA should be blockaded and and allowed to blockade by Canadian authorities who didn't do anything to stop it initially. Um, so this is serious stuff, you know. It's not a joke. And, and the Americans don't treat uh, their sovereignty or their energy sovereignty as a joke, as we tend to, about our own. So is this really a competitive thing where he wants to block tanker traffic from B.C. just to keep his refineries humming with Alaskan oil? Well, I think at some level there's that that uh, conflict that he hasn't really thought through. I'm not sure I've seen the evidence that he is kind of in league with, uh, you know, the oil refineries to do this. I, I don't, I don't really think that's what's going on, but I, but I think that he's not thinking about the issues. He's just thinking about, um, you know, Jay Inslee, if you look at the democratic presidential process for the American presidency in 2020, he's actually got his hat in the ring. He, uh, was, uh, part of a list of names that was polled recently. He, he's, He's not that popular. He actually got zero percent of, of, uh, I guess, support for his presidential bid. Like, there's nobody want, who wants him. Joe Biden is right at the top, and others are ranked down below, like Beto and and so on. But but he's right at the very bottom, the very last name. Uh, so I don't think he's got a hope. But uh, nevertheless, he is he's out there talking about uh, how, how terrible Canadian uh, oil shipping is. I mean, there's no there's no rational argument for that. It's it's pu- pure invention and fantasy. I mean, if he was honest about it, he'd be talking about how he's going to shut down all the ships that are shipping oil on a much greater volume to American refineries. Now, why would you do that? I mean, he's he's shipping uh, rail cars of oil down the Columbia River um, like never before, this this so-called environmental uh, uh, governor of Washington State at the same time as criticizing Canada. He really needs to mind his own business. And, and I think uh, more people need to send him that message because he is, so far he's, uh, you know, I think quite deceptively, he's pulled the, the wool over the eyes of a lot of Washington voters who think when they hear the rhetoric about him wanting to, to do good things for the Salish Sea, really it's a double standard. And he's really not credible on this whatsoever. Stuart, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Jim. 
My guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Work Society. His Twitter handle, s at sj muir. You can find his website at resourceworks.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. If you have any questions for Stuart or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.